Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you today. Amy Berger is a certified nutrition specialist and has a master's degree in human nutrition. Over the years, she has written several books, including The Alzheimer's Antidote and The Stall Slayer. Both books are related to low-carbohydrate diets and their impacts on obesity, mental disorders, and other chronic diseases. Her latest book is called End Your Carbohydrate Confusion, which she wrote in 2020 with Dr. Eric Westman. Her website, tuitnutrition.com, is full of amazing resources and articles, including one I will never forget you wrote about gluconeogenesis that absolutely blew me away. It was so good. I learned so much from that. She is a United States Air Force veteran and currently lives in Durham, North Carolina. Amy, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you on Boundless Body Radio. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to read this from your website. Tuit Nutrition, a source of sanity in a sea of nutritional madness. <laughs> we, how, we really are living in a sea of nutritional madness. What made you um, realize that? <laughs> Um, well, I, that's almost out of date. I have kind of a new motto that I came up with a couple of years ago, which is keto without the crazy, but yep. there, I like them both equally. I mean, the, the nutritional madness, I just think even, even within the low carb world itself, it's a sea of madness, let alone the, the subset of the sea of nutritional craziness that, that low carb is, you know, it's just, there's, there's so much conflicting information out there and confusing information. And, you know, people are doing really well on diets that are complete opposites. And it's, uh, I, I still get confused and overwhelmed myself. I can't imagine just being a lay person out there, just trying to make sense of, of what to do to be healthy. I can't even imagine trying to figure it out. I was, it was just a few weeks ago. I went into a bookstore for something not related to nutrition and just, just for the hell of it. Like I haven't been in a bookstore in a while. I didn't, you know, shop around on Amazon just for the hell of it. I went to the nutrition section just to see what was going on. I was stunned five entire bookcases floor to ceiling and like two thirds of them were keto, low carb, something. I, I was shocked. Like, I know it's getting more popular, but holy smokes, how many of these books do we need? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because, you know, I, I've been, I've been doing low carb myself for a long time now. When I was new, it was, it was pretty limited and it's, it's fascinating to see how popular it's become and it's everywhere, but the, there's more information out there, but there's more misinformation and there's more just over complication for sure. Mm. Well, we are very excited today. I went out and bought a scale to weigh my food. Um, I've got my tracker <laughs> here, so I'm ready for you to tell us and the listeners exactly what to eat. I've been saving my money so I can go to the health food store to buy all the foods and supplements and get all the recipes. And this is the very last episode of Boundless Body we're ever going to do because you're going to tell us exactly what to do and what to eat and that'll be over and then we can go out and call everybody else stupid <laughs> well i hope you know you got the food scale i hope you also got the keto meter and the blood meter and yes. the step counter and the sleep ring and all the other stuff i'm ready i'm ready let's do this it's the only way you and, can get fit <laughs> i hope we we clear up the point that we are being sarcastic Absolutely. Um, you mentioned your own personal history. I want to get into that a little bit more before we get into your latest work. So tell us a little bit how you found the low carbohydrate world. You were kind of on the leading edge of that. Oh, um, thanks. I, I, I don't know if I would say that, but I, I got into this the way a lot of other people do. I was overweight. And technically, by the, B, by the stupid measurement that is the BMI, I'm actually still right on the cusp of overweight. <laughs> I'm at like the very, very high end of normal, quote unquote normal. But no, I, I used to be heavier and I, I wasn't morbidly obese. It wasn't that you know much, but I was chubby and I was chubby despite regular exercise and eating what I thought was a good diet. I even ran marathons. I mean, I ran two marathons with the assumption that there's no way that I could do all that running, that I could train for marathons and not lose weight. Well, the joke was on me because that's exactly what happened. I ran two marathons and didn't lose weight. Yep. And um, it really wasn't until I discovered the low carb way of eating that the weight came off. And not only did the weight come off, but the weight came off 
while I got to eat steak and salads with blue cheese and roasted Brussels sprouts and bacon. And I, it's, it's not that, I mean, at this point, I, I, I've been eating this way for over 20, almost 20 years now. Yeah, about that, yeah, give or take a um, couple, couple of years. And I, I don't feel deprived anymore. Like I just, it's just the way I eat. But, you know, I'm not going to say that I don't have to restrict. There are certain things that I just don't eat. Um, but I overall, in general, I get to have lost this weight and, and have kept it off all these years without starving myself, without, you know, working out four hours a day. And um, after being in and out of a lot of jobs that I didn't really like and wasn't fulfilled by it occurred to me, hey, you know, nutritionist is a career. Maybe I could do that and I could help other people learn about this awesome, fun, delicious way of eating. So I went back to graduate school to get formal training in nutrition. And now I, I do work with clients and I'm a, I'm a writer. You know, I've written a lot of just articles and stuff about this. And over the years that I've been learning about this and how it all works and why, you know, learning about the science and the biochemistry of it, weight loss is one of the least impressive things that eating this way can do. And I'm not downplaying that. I mean, if you are 300 pounds, 400 pounds, weight loss is a big deal, but you can literally reverse type two diabetes, PCOS, hypertension, gout, migraines. I mean, there's so many really debilitating health issues that this way of eating either completely gets rid of or improves a great deal. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really great story too. I think a lot of people find themselves in that mess where they're they're following the standard advice. We're doing what you told us to do and it's simply not working. So we we either suck at this or the it's bad advice. <laughs> yeah. And and I want to say, you know, like we were we were saying earlier, um with the, you know, the nutritional madness, it's like when I was new to this, now I discovered low carb around 1998. I didn't actually stick with it until around 2003, but I found it actually through the Atkins book. Um, and Dr. Atkins gets a bad reputation these days in the keto world, but he really shouldn't. He really was so far ahead of his time and was so brilliant. And anyone having any success on this modern incarnation of keto really owes him a debt of gratitude because frankly, unless you're doing a medical ketogenic diet, like for epilepsy or something, if you're just kind of doing a very low carb diet for the purpose of losing weight or improving your blood sugar and blood pressure and all that, you are actually doing the Atkins diet wrapped up in a shiny new bow. We call it keto. But anyway, that's the long way of saying when I was new to this, like we were saying before, there was nowhere near as much information. I don't even think I don't remember about Facebook, but I know YouTube didn't exist, Reddit, Instagram, they didn't even exist when I was new to this. So there was a lot less information available, but there was a lot less uh, misinformation and confusing information. Mm. You know, there were fewer resources, but the resources that existed were pretty solid. And there just wasn't, it was easier, it was easier to get started back then than I, if I was new now, I can't even imagine how I would get started or who I would listen to or how I would figure it out. I really, I really can't even imagine. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's so many jumping in points and so many different points of view. So that's why we invited you on today. We wanted to maybe create like a guide for somebody who has heard of this. They see keto on the magazines at the grocery store. It's getting more and more popular. I, I just wanted to kind of give like a really simple guide to somebody who wants to get started and, and demystify it a little bit. And I'm going to preface this by saying we used to have to do like two month weight loss challenges with the company that we worked with. And, you know, they would, they would give everybody these food lists and, you know, a bunch of recipes and you have to go shop for stuff. And, you know, meal prep took hours and hours on Saturday and Sunday, and most people weren't successful. So over time we learned that if we, if we just did this in a low carb way, let's, let's print out some, you know, really simple recipes from diet doctor. And let's teach them a little bit of the science of how your metabolism works and why we don't necessarily need to count calories or things like that. And, and what I would do is anybody who signed up in our group, we would have a seminar in the beginning where we would explain, okay, this is what you're going to do. Don't, don't worry too much about it. Forget the word keto. Just, just eat as much of this stuff as you like. 
then we would have to do a middle one where we would see how everybody was doing and we'd make some course corrections and help people pass, you know, if they were stalling in their weight or whatever. And then we would do one at the very end where we'd say, great, you've completed this. Now, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And so I kind of wanted to go to your most recent book and, and kind of make that like, what's a beginner guide? What does somebody need to know? Not, and not too much, but what do they, what do they need to know to get started? Yeah, this uh, the book that I, I co-wrote with Dr. Eric Westman, who actually trained directly with Dr. Atkins um, back in the day. Uh, we it, it's called End Your Carb Confusion, and it it is the book that I would want if I was new. This is the simplest, most down to earth, plain English guide as to why to do low carb, how to do it, who should do it. I mean, frankly, not everybody needs a low carb diet, but um, and it's, it's funny, you were saying, you know, talking about all the meal prep and all this advanced stuff and the tracking and our book is like the opposite of that. You know, we, we make it very clear that you can do this on any budget. You can, if you want to buy all grass fed pasture raised meats, that's great. If you can't afford it, if all you can afford is that tube of ground beef that they sell at the discount store, that's great too. And um, you could even, you could even, if you don't cook at all, you can actually be perfectly successful, you know, dining out or getting takeout or even fast food for every meal, as long as you know what to order. And so in terms of getting started, the, the number one most important thing, and the thing that actually makes this way of eating effective, the thing that, that makes all of these fundamental primary changes inside you is keeping your carbohydrate intake really low. Everything else is secondary. People worry about, should I have MCT oil? Should I fast? Should I do this? Should I do that? What about putting butter in my coffee? All of that is meaningless unless you're doing the single most important thing that actually makes this way of eating work. And that's just keeping your carb intake really low. Is that why you called the book End Your Carbohydrate Confusion rather than calling it just keto something? I've heard you answer this question before, and I think it's really interesting. Yeah, we we purposely kept the word keto out of the title because our book is not just a keto book. Our book has three different phases of carbohydrate intake because not everybody needs a strict keto diet. And we actually have a checklist that walks, depending on your answers to the questions, it points you to a level of carbohydrate intake that's appropriate for you. And um, of course, you know, many, many millions of people really do, you know, will do best at the ketogenic level, at least to start. But what we try to do throughout the book is, is end the confusion. You know, why, why do so many people have such problems when they eat too much carbohydrate? Why do other people not? Why do we all have friends and family members that can eat tons of fruit and pasta and bread and they're fine and we can't? Um, and, and we, we, we talk about why to keep these things to a minimum in your diet. You know, what happens in your body when you eat too many of these things and what happens when you start cutting them out of your diet. And, um, you know, besides, besides clearing up that confusion, you know, why can some people eat more carbs and others can't? I, the main goal of the book is to clear up confusion about how to do this way of eating and how to basically make it your whole, make it your life, make it not, not, not your obsessive, but make it the way you eat for life. Make it, it's, it's not a diet. It's not a thing you go on for six months and you lose weight and you go back. It's how do you do this for the long term? And that's why we, besides just the keto portion, there's these other levels of higher carb intake where you, you might be in a situation where your health is so severely compromised or, or you're looking to lose so much weight that the strictest approach is best for you. You know, maybe you're looking to lose a hundred pounds or more, or you have diabetes or something. And so being really strict is probably best, but what happens when you get closer and closer and reach your goal? Okay, you've lost the weight, all the medical problems you had are gone, you're off the medication. Now what? Do you need to keep eating super strict keto for the rest of your life or 
might you have room to have a sweet potato or to go to your favorite Mexican place and have the rice and beans? And so we we try to kind of answer all those questions and we try to do it in a way that is entirely scientifically sound, but it's plain English. It's it's readable. You don't need a PhD to understand it. And um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's what I think. That's awesome. That last part I want to come back to because I think that is super important, what you guys decided to do with the book. I really like it. Um, and we'll get back to that. One thing that I think is really interesting that a lot of people assume is that we sit here and say that carbohydrates are bad. What are we really trying to tell people when we're when we're asking them or suggesting to them that they could have success on a low carbohydrate diet? Are carbohydrates themselves bad? Right. So in our in our book, we go out of our way to not demonize anything except we do we do kind of point a finger at sugar. Um, you know, I like refined sugar, but fruit, you know, we, we say in the book, something to the effect of it, frankly, would be stupid and, and false of us to say that cantaloupe causes diabetes or that people became obese because they ate too many lentils. You know, these are, <laughs> these are carbohydrate rich foods that healthy, lean, robust people have eaten for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And so to say that these foods have caused you know, issues that have only really exploded in incidents over the past, you know, let's say have 50 or 60 years. That's clearly not the case. There's something else going on. But that being said, for when, when you already have a health condition that makes you intolerant to these foods, then those foods are maybe best avoided at least for some period of time. So even if you know, sweet potatoes and apples and chickpeas didn't cause your issue, you might need to cut way back on them or eliminate them to reverse the issue. It's 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 kind of a it's a hard distinction to make sense of, but um we don't we don't really demonize the carbohydrate, but frankly, if you are living with a with a medical issue that is caused by or made worse by chronically high blood sugar or insulin, then you need to stop eating foods that massively raise your blood sugar and insulin. I mean, that's pretty, pretty basic stuff there, you would think. And um, it's, I, I guess what, what, what surprises a lot of people is that they don't realize just how many health problems fall into that category. You know, it's we're not just talking about type 2 diabetes here when we talk about blood sugar or insulin, you know, PCOS, gout, hypertension, erectile dysfunction, BPH, enlarged prostate, fatty liver, like there's the, the list is endless. And even if you are at a quote unquote normal weight, and I, I hate that phrase because I don't know what a normal weight is, but you know, even if you're not overweight and even if you don't have diabetes, you might still have any number of these issues because it, it there's other factors going on. Mm. You talk about this a lot, and we've had Dr. Ben Bickman on the show, and he helped us kind of understand this a little bit better too, but I, I really think there's so much confusion about this that I'd really like you to highlight the difference between blood sugar and insulin. Because I still have people throwing those two terms around like they're the same thing. And they're absolutely not. And people are so confused by this. So tell us, you know, from, from the carbohydrate to the blood sugar to the insulin, how are all those things different but related? Yeah. Oh, man. I, I love Dr. Bickman. So it's your, your audience got best. a real treat with him. He's the best. He's, He's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when when we eat foods that are high in carbohydrate, now, I guess before I even say any of this, we have to make it clear that everybody's different. Everybody's body responds differently to different foods. You and I could eat the exact same amount of the exact same food. And one of us will have a massive rise in blood sugar and one of us won't. You know, it's really, there's so much uh, individual variation to this. It's why I actually don't like the glycemic index because a food could be low glycemic to you and very high glycemic to me, right? Meaning it would raise my blood sugar a lot and it would barely bud yours. But um, with that in mind, yeah, when we eat foods, primarily foods that are high in carbs, it raises our blood sugar and 
rising blood sugar signals the pancreas to send out insulin because insulin helps to get blood sugar into, to get, get glucose into your cells and out of the bloodstream. Except that's only one of uh, many, many other jobs that insulin has. I guess, I guess what I can say is some, some people, not some, many, many people can have chronically high insulin, even if their blood sugar is normal. And it's actually the blood sugar is being kept normal by the very high insulin. And so if they go to the doctor and they get their fasting blood sugar checked or even their hemoglobin A1C, which is kind of that longer term average measurement, those could be perfectly normal. And yet this person has a lot of unexplained, weird sort of nagging health issues. And the doctor doesn't really understand what's going on because the person is at a normal weight and their blood sugar is normal. But if they would only test insulin, they would see that this insulin is sky high. And um, it's it's just a, a huge, huge factor that's being completely missed so much today. I mean, it's more and more doctors are starting to understand this, but it's still a really small fraction of the whole medical system right now. Hmm. That was very well explained and, and relatively simple to understand. I, I think it's so important. So now this is starting to seem like a supply problem. You're talking about cantaloupes and lentils and things like that. You don't see a lot of those on the land, at least where I am. And you also talked about refined sugar, which now we find everywhere. You can eat any of that stuff all day, every day for the rest of your life. That seems to be where the problem is with the carbohydrates is not necessarily that that we respond one way to them or another, but that they're just ubiquitously everywhere. You can't get away from them hardly. That's a really good point because, you know, ev evolutionarily, we would have, it, depending on where you lived in the world, depending on the latitude, you would have maybe had a lot of fruit and a lot of sweet things in the summertime, and then they would have not been available again for another several months. So you would have gone some period of every year kind of eating higher carb foods and fattening up, and then you would have been unfattening and, and you would have been on a much lower carb diet depending on the season. The modern food supply has robbed us of that seasonality. You know, you can live in like, I don't know if there's a Whole Foods in North Dakota, but let's just assume there is. You could go to a Whole Foods in North Dakota in January and buy mangoes and bananas. You know, so it's, um, I think you hit it on the head when you said it's really just the ubiquity. And, you know, there's a lot of people that get very neurotic and very religious minded when it comes to low carbon keto. And every year when it's Thanksgiving and Christmas and the holidays or Halloween, they just go, oh my goodness, like my kids, they can't have the candy and this is a disaster. When the fact is, if we only really ever really gorged ourselves on sugar and starch and sweet things at those at Halloween, at Christmas, on our birthday, a couple of times a year, it would be no problem. The problem is that we eat like it's Thanksgiving every single day. It's nonstop. I mean, before I, before I went low carb, I lived on carbohydrate. It's a miracle I have any pancreatic function left whatsoever. I'm from New York City. I would have a bagel the size of my head every morning with a glass of juice. Three hours later, I was starving, so I'd probably have a granola bar. Lunch would be, you know, a sandwich with chips. I'm snacking on pretzels midday, dinner is pasta. It's just a nonstop <laughs> infusion of sugar and starch all day, every day. It's not, it's not having a, an occasional piece of fruit once in a while that's making anybody sick. You guys made such a good point on that note too, by talking about the holiday. <laughs> I think that is very well said and easy to remember. Like if you're going to have a holiday, that's not a hollow week or a hollow 40 years <laughs> lifetime of eating way too many carbohydrates. Exactly. That, that's a Dr. Westmanism. So I give him credit for that. He, you know, he is a, an internal medicine doctor, so he sees patients and even, even knowing what he knows about how important it is to eat this way, he'll tell his patients, look, Christmas is coming up or it's Valentine's Day, have whatever you want, but don't let the holiday turn into a hollow week or a hollow month. I love <laughs> that's, that. That's, that's exactly really, right. really good. I like that. Um, okay. So we've talked a little bit about some of those chronic diseases and we, I, you know, I'm, I'm with you, I'm with Dr. Ben Bickman, where I think we were miss, we're not, we're not treating the real problem. We're waiting for blood glucose to be the problem rather than 
you know, addressing the insulin problem right away. And so things like type 2 diabetes and obesity, they take a long time to kind of build up. So in the in-between time, what might be some good signs or symptoms for somebody to say they're heading down that path and they should probably do something sooner rather than later? What things might they notice in their life? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it probably varies because not, you know, different people will have different signs and symptoms. So you, you can get your insulin tested. I mean, that's something I wish that fasting insulin was a routine part of a checkup, just like your blood sugar and your blood pressure are. Um, and, and the thing is, you know, it's not a slam dunk, like your fasting insulin, just like your blood sugar can, can be a little bit high for a number of reasons that don't necessarily automatically indicate a problem. So it's not 100% reliable, but you would look at that fasting insulin level in conjunction with all of this other stuff that, I, that I'm about to, to mention. If, if your insulin is chronically high, um, you might have you might have, you know, hypertension that's unexplained. Like you just, you don't know why your blood pressure is high. You're eating, even, even if you do a low sodium diet, it still hasn't come down. Um, some people get migraines, skin tags is a good one. Um, inability to lose weight. Even if you're doing what you think is a, you know, a good diet and exercise, if you're having trouble losing weight, um, let's see, you know, hypoglycemia is one that surprises people like like why would i have high insulin well it's if you eat a high carb food and you have an especially large insulin response it's going to actually make your blood sugar too low and you'll crash afterward so people that have hypoglycemia tend to just have a an over overachieving insulin response let's say hmm. um and there's other things in your actual blood work that you could look at that you wouldn't necessarily feel as a symptom in your body like not everybody, but many people with the high insulin, it will go hand in hand with, with high triglycerides and low HDL cholesterol. I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, th those are the big ones. I mean, sometimes, eh, no, nah, I, I don't want to say too much of it. Elevated liver enzymes, but, you know, sometimes the central central obesity, like where you're, you're kind of thin, but you've got a little pot belly or you, you know, you, you see a lot of these men that they have strong arms and legs, like they're they're pretty strong, but they, it looks like they have a beach ball in their stomach. That tends to be the, uh, Dr. William Davis, he wrote the book, he called that a wheat belly. Some doctors call it an insulin pouch. Mm. Yeah, the, I, I think that is a really easy one to tell. If you are carrying fat in the midsection, you probably have some insulin resistance going on. I love that you mentioned the hypoglycemia because I don't think a lot of people would really consider it. And in fact, I pulled up on Google before to show people when the soda store near my house where people go to grab soda and cookies and get all kinds of mixed soda drinks together, what time during the day is that the most busy? And lo and behold, it's like right at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And I'm sitting there thinking like, why in the world would this be really busy? Why are people so hungry for sugar at 3 p.m.? They probably just ate a few hours ago. Most people think that's totally normal. You eat and then you feel fine. And then an hour or two later, you're starving and you're hangry and you have to go to the break room or you need to go out and get a snack. Most people think that's just normal. Like it, like after dinner, they're hungry. And so you eat popcorn and snacks and chips and whatever else. And it's like, why are you hungry? That makes no sense. So I don't think a lot of people consider that. I'm really glad that you said that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big one, hypoglycemia. Hmm. Okay, so what are some of the things that you highlight in the book for somebody that does want to get started? They, they are relating to some of those things. What are some tips and tricks that might help them initially that doesn't overcomplicate things, it makes things really simple and can help them kind of get started? If you ha huh, I have to give the warning, if you're on medication for type 2 diabetes, or even type 1, people with type 1 diabetes can do a low-carb diet. Um, if you're on medication, especially insulin. And if you're on certain blood pressure medications, you do want to make sure that you have a doctor or some kind of medical professional monitoring you because this way of eating is so effective and it can start making changes in your body so rapidly that you might need to have your medication adjusted before you start the diet. Like two or three days later, it's actually going to be too late. 
Um, that's how effective, you know, the minute you stop eating foods that raise your blood sugar, you can't really take the same dose of medication that you were taking when you were eating a ton of foods that raised your blood mm -hmm. sugar. So um, that's that's the, the one warning we have. Other than that, you know, if I can sort of impart any nugget of wisdom here, um, this isn't as complicated as people are making it out to be. Just take the starch and sugar out of your diet. You know, if you normally, let's say you were going to go out to breakfast and you have an omelet and it comes with toast and pancakes or, you know, a biscuit, like just, just get the omelet, get it with the cheese and the veg, like that's it. Going any restaurant, I've never been to a restaurant where I couldn't ask to substitute a non-starchy vegetable for something starchy. For example, like at a steakhouse, you get a steak and it comes with the potato and a green vegetable. Ask to just double up on the green vegetables and hold the potato. Um, and it's, it's so, your plate really just needs to be a nice generous portion of fatty-ish protein and some non-starchy vegetables. It could be pork, it could be chicken, it could be beef, lamb, bison, fish, whatever you like. It's entirely customizable. If you are kosher or halal and you don't wanna eat pork and shellfish, don't eat pork and shellfish. If you are allergic to certain things, you can make this diet entirely your own all you have to do is keep the sugar and starch out of it. And there's so much that you can eat that I, I recommend that too. focus on all the things that you can eat and not the things you're getting rid of. Mm, I love that. One of my favorite questions to ask somebody when we're first meeting and doing our initial consultation is they're asking for a plan is I will ask them, do you like really, would you like this to be simple or would you like this to be complicated? And everybody says the same thing. They go, oh my God, it's a, I, my life is so busy already. This has to be the most simple thing ever or I'm not going to do it. And I'd say, great. Then what you should do is when you're hungry, try to eat as much kind of salty, fatty meat as you possibly can. I would kind of focus on red meat, get everything else out as best you can. If you like vegetables, go ahead and do that. And that's about it. And then I'll be quiet. And they'll, they'll look at me and they'll go, oh. And they'll wait a second and then they'll go, um, well, well, how many meals should I eat? I go, I don't know. Just when you're hungry, eat those things. Oh, what about this supplement, such and such fat burner? I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> you're making things a little bit more complicated. I thought you said you wanted simple. I, You can do that if you want. Well, what about this exercise program and this meal plan? It's like, you you just told me you wanted to do this simple. Like, it doesn't have to be that complicated. <laughs> I I could not agree more. I mean, that that's why we wrote this book, because... You know, when when you get the diet right, you don't need anything else. And and I hate like I I I help people in whatever way they need to be helped if I'm able to, but I I dread when people ask me, well, how many calories should I have or how many grams of this? And I'm like, no, 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 that's not how this works. The beauty, the the beauty of keto is that you shouldn't have to worry about the numbers and the math and tracking and the spreadsheets. Now, if you like that, some people are just data geeks. They want to see the numbers. Great. I'm not, I'm never the day that I have to pull out an app or a spreadsheet. When I sit down at the dinner table, just put me out of my misery. Just take me out <laughs> to the pasture and shoot me. <laughs> um, I, I just love food too much to turn it into a calculus problem. And, um, I, I, I agree with what you said, you know, when you're new, just eat when you're hungry, eat as much of X, Y, Z foods and, and don't worry about the rest. And I, that's when people, most of the people who come to me are actually already doing this and they're just not getting the results they want. So we have to troubleshoot and tweak. But when I get somebody who's brand new, I tell them, I don't want you to worry at all about how much you're eating or how many times a day you're eating. I don't care how much you eat. Just stick to this list. As long as you only eat foods that are on this list, you eat as much as you want, as often as you want. Let's just let your body get adjusted to this new metabolic state. Let's just worry about getting used to not eating any carbs. And then if we're not happy with how weight loss is going or whatever, issue you're trying to resolve, then we can look if maybe we have to, you know, change your numbers a little bit. But I just really, truly, the beauty of this is that you shouldn't have to micromanage all those details. Well, now I got to be honest, you're making me feel really bad about buying the food scale and all the trackers. I, I hope I have <laughs> receipts for all this stuff. 
I, I, um, I'm sitting in a bedroom that has a bookshelf and a lot of nutrition books. And there's nutrition books there that have pages and pages and pages of references and tons of studies and very scientifically done. And I really appreciate those books. They're really great for me to deep dive. I can look into the studies. I can learn really complicated things, but some of them are not ones that I could really like share with somebody. Like I can learn this stuff and maybe distill it down kind of the way you do. And you've got such a gift for that, but you decided to write this book and purposely exclude any scientific references. And when I first heard that, I thought that is bananas. That is, that's a terrible idea. And the more I thought about it, I was like, that's actually brilliant. That's a really good idea. Tell me about making that decision. And how did you feel about that personally? Because I know you and I know your work and you are very scientifically minded. That must've been kind of a difficult thing to grapple with. Yeah, it's um that it, it's actually Dr. Westman's decision that I went along with, and uh, but I, I I will defend it. Um, he, I mean, part of the reason we don't have any of that is we don't say anything controversial in the book. There's there's nothing we say in there that has to be defended or that has to be backed up or substantiated with a study. When we say hey, some people do really well with carbs and some people don't. Do we need a randomized controlled trial to prove that to somebody? <laughs> you know, and um, it's, it's the, so that's part of it. We don't really say anything that's that's very controversial or uncertain. And, you know, Dr. Westman said, where's, where's the references? Well, how about my 20 years of treating X thousands of patients? <laughs> who have gotten off their diabetes medications, gotten off their blood pressure medications, all their lipids are better. Um, so yeah, it is It is a little bit iffy though. And I'm, I'm very surprised that we haven't taken any heat for that so far, but it's probably, the book, the book has been out for only about a month. So I suspect that that may be coming at us soon, but so far we haven't, um, and, and it's almost like, you know, I've heard Dr. Westman say, you know, that Shakespeare quote or whatever, playwright it was from, you know, he, he doth protest too much, me thinks, or the lady doth protest too much, me thinks. Mm. Like if, if you have to back something up with 20 references, you must not be that confident in what you're saying, which I, I have to take issue with because my Alzheimer's book, I have like a, a load of references. But for me, I think Dr. Westman felt more comfortable with that because he is a physician. He is an MD. I'm a nutritionist. And so I feel like if I'm going to say something about health um, and not just food, I, I maybe should protect myself by saying, well, you know, don't just take my word for it. This study backs it up. Um, I could see he might be a little more courageous in going without that. Well, I just, for the style of book that you guys wanted to write, I think it fits perfectly. I think it's great. People can look this stuff up. They can get other books that they want. You mentioned mm -hmm. tweaking things, which reminds me of your second book, The Stall Slayer. And this was you know, kind of the, the, the middle of the, of our little weight loss thing that we used to do, it, it would be like three or four weeks in and people would have gotten really good results, but oftentimes they would hit a wall and be stalled out a little bit. And you mentioned that's when we need to do some tweaking. So tell me a little bit about that book and how you recommend getting around a weight loss stall when you're eating a low carb diet. Yeah, thank you. The book is called the stall slayer and that's uh, they can get it at stallslayer.com or it's also on Amazon. Um, it's stalled fat loss is probably the number one reason that anyone ever writes to me for help. You know, why isn't this working? Like I, I lost 10 pounds and now I haven't lost anything in two months or I've been doing this. I didn't lose any weight. And it just depends on the person's situation. There's a lot of different reasons for that. And um, so the, the book goes through like, I don't know, like I guess seven or so reasons and, and gives you strategies for how to fix them. And the number one is, you know, we kind of opened this podcast saying that the the single most important thing to do is keep your carb intake really low. And so some people just aren't quite low enough in carbs for the quote unquote magic to happen. And that's that's a little bit of hyperbole, but they just, a lot of people just are eating more carbs than they realize. You know, it's not, not that they're waking up and having pancakes and grape juice for breakfast, but they're just these little, oh, one little piece of this, one little piece of that. And um, these newfangled sort of low carb and keto packaged things that are higher in carbs than people realize. Um, so we just, sometimes sometimes it's tweaking the diet. Sometimes people are on medications that make it more difficult to lose weight. 
Um, my personal passion is helping people understand thyroid issues because that's really big when it comes to stubborn fat loss too. Mm. I'm so glad you mentioned the carbohydrates creeping back in. That's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. It's one of the things that I get asked about all the time also. Somebody can be really strict for a little while, and then then it, it, they, they creep. They creep back in. They make it back in the diet. And I want you to comment a little bit, if you can, about the difference between the amount of carbohydrate versus the frequency of carbohydrate. Because I think somebody can say like, okay, this dude told me to stay under 100 grams of carbohydrates. Great. I'm going to suck on you know 20 diet Jolly Ranchers all day, and that meets my carbohydrate need. But that's not the same thing, Correct. Yeah, I I actually know less about that, but I think, you know, if you look at some of the studies on intermittent fasting, some of those intermittent fasting can be effective for uh, not so much the fat loss, but improving blood sugar and improving other things about metabolic health, even in people who are not on low carb diets. So that does suggest that the frequency of eating, and, and it would be the frequency of eating carbs because these studies are done in people just eating normal type Western American diets, um, that just having an extended period of time throughout the day where you're not eating helps the blood sugar and insulin kind of come back down to normal. So I do think that even if you're on a low carb or keto diet, it's, I don't think extended fasting is required, but I also think it's not the best idea to be grazing all day. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and, and what I, I do want to make the point too, though, that, you know, you were saying when people do these weight challenges, they do really well. And then it kind of stops. One of the first things I talk about in the stall slayer is how to define a stall. People really need to understand that if, if it's been a week or two and you haven't lost any weight, that's not a stall. <laughs> like it's your body doesn't magically lose a few ounces steadily at a regular pace every single day until you magically arrive at your goal weight. I wish it worked that well and that predictably, you know, it's, it's very normal for things to, you know, you'll lose a couple of pounds and you'll stay the same for a bit, lose a bit more, stay the same, gain a pound or two, then drop. It's like this squiggly sort of pattern, but as long as you're losing weight over the long term, that's fine. And, and especially with low carb, you know, we know you drop a lot of weight initially, especially if you really do keto, like you really, really do strict low carb. Depending on how heavy you are when you start, people can lose 10 or 20 pounds in two or three weeks. I mean, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal rate of loss, but then it slows down and that's normal. People have to you know, understand that uh, it's, it's normal for it to slow down. And then you cannot only go by the scale because for women especially, but men too, it's not uncommon to go down a size or two with no change on the scale. So even if your actual scale weight isn't changing, your size and shape can be changing. And I think there's a lot of people that get so obsessed with that scale number and it really messes with their head when they're actually doing really well, but because they're so obsessed with that number, they're ignoring the fact that their pants are really loose or their, you know, their ring fell off them. Yeah. I'm so glad you clarified that. I, I would see that all the time where somebody would do low carb, they would lose some weight, then they'd plateau and they'd be like, wow, see, I, I knew this wasn't going to work. And you're like, okay, really? Just because you didn't lose a little bit of weight in one week, but your energy is through the roof and your mental clarity is better. And you, you just got off of three medications. Like those aren't also really good reasons to continue trying the diet. Like there's so many exactly. benefits. I mean, there's, we, yeah, we call those the non-scale victories. There's so many good things happen on the inside, and the weight, the weight will will catch up eventually. <clears throat> you mentioned, you mentioned keto products. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's on the list of of things I would get questions about all the time, and that would be one of those for me as well. Where I would say, okay, you're just starting out. Go ahead. If 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 a keto cake is better than a bagel and a piece of cake, <laughs> a real cake then go ahead, have a keto cake, have, have these keto bars or drinks or shakes or whatever. But that is definitely on a short list of things that I would address if somebody were stalling. Is, is that something pretty common that you see as well? Oh yeah, I agree a hundred million percent. Um, I, I think there's definitely a place for those things. They are fabulous if as a transition step, if you consider yourself a sugar addict or 
if keto is going to be really, really hard for you to stick to, if you can't have some kind of cookie, well, then for God's sake, have the keto cookie. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately the goal is to break the need for something sweet at all, or to get to a point where those things, even the keto versions are just a once in a while treat. You don't have them every single day. And, and it's for two reasons. When Now, he, here's the caveat, of course. If somebody's eating this stuff on a regular basis, but they're happy with with their weight and their health and how they feel, then it's then that's fine. If if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, if if whatever you're doing is working for you, keep doing it. But if you're not happy, then you have to see what's going on. And yeah, some of these keto products, some there's a lot of different types of sugar alcohols, these these sweetening agents. Some of them are pretty benign and, and you know, neutral toward blood sugar and insulin. Some of them have an effect and it's not it doesn't mess with your blood sugar and insulin as much as regular sugar does or maple syrup or honey or whatever. But it does still affect them. And not only that, this is I'm going to burst everybody's bubble here, but fat is not unlimited on keto. Just because we embrace fat, we all love our bacon and our coconut oil, doesn't mean we can eat an unlimited amount of it, especially when we're already having trouble losing our own stored body fat. And a lot of these keto treats are really high in fat because they're made with the almond flour and uh, you know cream cheese and coconut butter and almond butter. And it's it's just a lot. It's a very concentrated source of fat. And if people are eating a lot, of it, it's, it's almost like I, I consider it like the keto version of those Snackwell's cookies. Remember, like, oh, oh it's fat free so I can eat the whole box. Well, just because something's keto and low in carbs doesn't mean you can eat the whole thing. And I, I've I've learned this the hard way. Like I say that with zero judgment, zero criticism, because I've done this myself. I've I've definitely overdone the zero carb foods. In fact, I just recently had to uh, say goodbye to pork rinds because I just I can't, I can't have them anymore because my serving size is like a family size bag. <laughs> so <laughs> just because they're zero carb, you know, they're not zero calorie. They're not zero fat. Yep. No, I was, I was at the store the other day and I saw a, a keto slim fast shake. I'm it, like, come on. <laughs> I guess I just ruined our chance of ever having slim fast be a show sponsor, but like, come on, that's <laughs> give me a break. I can't even read any of these ingredients back here. This is not like great for you. It's, um, yeah. It's like, it's crazy, but at the same time, it's it's almost nice to see because it shows how popular keto is becoming. That's that a good now point. we've got, you know, when when I was new to this, I would never have dreamed that one day you could go to the regular supermarket and buy riced cauliflower or zucchini spiral noodles. Like you had to make that yourself if you even knew that such a thing was possible. So it's it's really yeah, those ingredients can be kind of horrifying, but it's um it's a sign of the times that the, you know, these food companies have entire divisions devoted to like the economics, like, okay, where are people spending money? What's, you know, what's going to be the big trend next year? Where should we put our marketing efforts? And they see that it's keto right now. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think of something like Primal Kitchens. What what a great brand. And and Mark Sisson, you know, started it years ago and he took so much flack you know, in the last few years because he sold to a big food company and it, you know, people called him a sellout and it's like, no, this is this, this giant food company recognized that these products are valuable and people will spend the money and they're trying to make this more wide stream. What's wrong with that? I think that's a great thing. So I think you do make a really good point there. Um, this has been really great so far learning about how to break through the stalls, how to get started. What about for long term? Do, do people need to do this for the rest of their lives? Oh, good question. So our book, our book really covers that. Um, some people want to do very strict keto forever just because they feel best that way. They they feel their best. They have the most energy. They maintain their weight effortlessly. Um, but some people, you know, like we said earlier, they might get to a point where, okay, you know, I'm happy with my weight. I feel really good. But you know, it might be nice to have some fruit every now and then, or it might be nice to have, you know, a piece of bread now and then. And there's definitely ways to do that without regaining the weight you lost and without triggering recurrences of the health issues that you got rid of. And that 
you know, unfortunately, it's an entirely individual thing. You have to figure out your own personal sweet spot for how much carbohydrate you can have and still maintain all the benefits of, of eating low carb. And for some people, it might be, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 grams of carbs a day. For some people, it might be 100 grams. And um, we, we teach you in End Your Carb Confusion how to do that, how to very, very gradually increase the intake so that you're able to identify that sweet spot for yourself. Mm. Um, and, and even, you know, even if you don't, we also make the point, if you do feel best with super strict keto, okay, maybe you do that like 98% of the time, but once a month you go to your favorite restaurant and you want to have the bread or you want to have the dessert, do that. Because like we were saying earlier, the, the once in a month treat, the once in a while splurge isn't what made any of us really sick or, or overweight. It's, it's that we were doing that every day. So um, there, there's definitely room and that's, you know, the keto world, as much as I love low carbon keto, we really have gone too far in demonizing some of this and, and making people downright terrified. I mean, I've had clients that were literally terrified of carrots and red peppers. Like we, we've, we've gone a little too far when we're, when we're getting into that area. Mm, interesting. Yeah. That's also really well explained. I, I always found that if somebody was asking me the question, like, do I have to do this long term? My answer would be like, okay, well, you just haven't done this enough. Like, do this a little bit longer. And then, generally speaking, that question never came up because why would you want to stop feeling amazing? Why would you want to not be all that hungry? Why would you not want to have more energy and time to go do all the stuff that you love and feel great and, and maintain body weight and not need to go to the doctor for medication all the time? Like, you, you yeah, exactly what no, you I said. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think when people start reaping the benefits of this, you won't want to go back. So that question becomes a moot point. But I do think you can, like, I don't think anyone that really benefits from keto is ever going to get to a point where they can eat, you know, 300 grams of carbs a day, but they might not have to stay at like 20 or 30 crazy, like Dr. Westman's famous page four diet, or it's called phase one in end your carb confusion. They might, you know, 50 grams of carbs, 60 grams of carbs is still a very low carb diet, but it gives you a lot more wiggle room for a little bit, of food, maybe even just larger amounts of, of the non-starchy vegetables. Um, so I think there are some people that will be able to increase carb intake at least a little bit, but still maintain all those good things you were talking about, the, the mental clarity and the energy and all that. Um, yeah, but like I, uh, for me myself, I'm probably never going to be able to maintain my weight, you know, going to the Italian restaurant and having the breadsticks and the pasta and the cheesecake and the wine. So, you know, <laughs> there, there is going to be a limit. Yep. But, but it's like you said, like there are going to be times when, yeah, I might not eat breadsticks at, you know, Olive Garden. There goes another show sponsor will never land, <laughs> but, but maybe I'll go to grandma's house and she's making cookies. Like I'm not going to be an asshole and like not have a, one of my grandma's cookies, but that also doesn't mean I want to sacrifice my energy and how I feel and show up in life every single day, going back to eating like bread all the time. So I think that was a really good point. And I'm really glad you made that. We mentioned stalls and how many questions you get about this. I'm sure you get almost just as many questions like this. Should men eat differently than women? Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Um, we asked this to everybody and we've gotten unique answers every time. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> the answer, <laughs> the answer is, is no and yes. And for the most part, no, we don't need to eat that differently. I know we are different genders. We are, uh, we're not different species, although I know sometimes it feels like we are. Um, I think there's not a whole lot of difference, except there's a couple of things that I see women get into trouble with on strict keto. And part of it is um, women tend to not eat anywhere near enough protein. 
And I just did a video on that for my YouTube channel. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, on keto, especially, we've been told too much protein turns into sugar, it kicks you out of ketosis, all these things that I'm sure Dr. Bickman explained, you like don't even have to worry about at all on a low carb diet for the most part. Um, but women also have been conditioned by these stupid women's magazines that your protein intake at, at a meal should be no larger than about a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. That is nonsense, ladies. Please, if you if you take nothing else away from this whole interview, eat more protein because I see women, they're scared to eat protein, but they're hungry because we are adult women and it's okay to eat. It's okay to have an appetite. Um, and so, but but they're afraid to eat protein. So instead of having a nice, big, very large steak or pork chop or something, they're going to eat a fat bomb or they're going to put three tablespoons of butter in their coffee. And then they wonder why they're not losing weight. Mm -hmm. Or for women, here's the, the other aspect. I, I will say, I do think there are some women who do feel better with a little more carbs. And again, I'm not talking two or 300 grams of carbs. I'm talking maybe they were doing very strict keto, like, like a healthy, young, active woman, someone that's already lean, already athletic, eating like a child with epilepsy, right? Because she's been scared into thinking that strict keto is the only way to be healthy and carbs will kill you and autophagy and blah, blah, blah. So she's terrified of carbs, but she's doing CrossFit nine times a week. And people like that need more carbs. You will, some, some women do run into a problem where they lose their period or they just become really exhausted and depressed and anxious. And I honestly think those women need a little bit more starch. Again, not a ton, but a little bit. So, I don't know, 70 grams or so. So still a low carb diet, but not ultra strict keto. Mm, I love that. I'm so glad you brought up the point of protein. I think that's so valuable. And, and I see the same thing as well. This has been an awesome conversation. I've, I've certainly learned a lot and you've been able to make this really simple, which again, is just such a gift of yours. I know I could ask you something extremely complicated and we could go down that rabbit hole, but also, if, if an eight-year-old asks you a question about nutrition, I know you'd be able to explain it to them. So that, I think, is really wonderful. What are you working on for the future? Uh, well, I'm sort of teaming up with Dr. Westman again. He is part of a company called Adapt Your Life that we are now doing some online courses to teach people about keto in our simple, uncomplicated way. And we have something called the Keto Made Simple Masterclass. People can go to adaptyourlife.com or adaptyourlifeacademy.com and just check out that masterclass. Um, it's going to be offered a few times throughout the year, but I, I don't know when this when this show will be out, but we have a new one coming up um, the end of January. But, you know, people can just check that out. And the second class, there's, it's not available yet, so there's no there's no website for it yet, but we're actually doing a class based on my Stall Slayer book. That's awesome. We'll look forward to that content. We're going to make sure we link to everything in the notes so everybody can find you. Um, which we'll talk about in a second, but I want to, I want to ask you one last question. Um, this is actually a listener question. And I think, I think a lot of people feel this way and they maybe don't even know how to phrase the question, but I want to, I want to end here. And I think I know what you're going to say, but I would, I would like to hear it in your words. And the listener's question is what's the best way to burn fat without shocking your body? Yeah, I guess the, the, the biochemical and biological fact is when you cut way back on carbohydrate, you will burn fat. It's just your body has no other choice. When there's not enough carbohydrate coming in to power your body, it's going to find an alternative fuel source. And the alternative fuel source it's going to use is fat. So that is how to get your body to burn fat. But burning fat does not equate to losing body fat. That's what we were talking about before. If you actually overdo dietary fat on a ketogenic diet, you will be burning fat, but you'll be burning all the fat from your food and the cream and the butter and the oil and the cheese rather than your stored body fat. So Dr. Westman says, you know, keto is a fat burning diet. He never calls it a weight loss diet. It's a weight loss diet if you do it right, but it is always a fat burning diet. Mm, that's a really great point and a really good answer. Where can people go to find your work? 
Uh, let's see. My website is toitnutrition.com, except we've run into this weird snag. You actually have to put www.toitnutrition for now. I'm, I'm trying to fix it, but if you just put in Tuit Nutrition, it won't come up. And that's T-U-I-T Nutrition. So www.toitnutrition.com. My YouTube channel is also called Tuit Nutrition, and that is my handle on Twitter. And uh, yeah, if you just if you look for me on Amazon, Amy Berger, all those books should come up. That's awesome. Like I said, we're going to link to that in the show notes. You have been super generous with your time. You post a lot of stuff for free. You are helping people. You're very dynamic. You're really engaging. I, I'm just so grateful that you had the time to come on. We didn't even touch any of your other work. And so if you don't mind coming back sometime to our program to talk a little about Alzheimer's and talk about gluconeogenesis and some of the other uh, things that you've put out there, we would be absolutely honored to have you back. Yeah, I'd love to. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. We're really grateful for you and for your work and for all the people you help. So thank you very much. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.